all of the all of the all of the flop Good evening, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the college and complexes. My name is Tim, and I'll be moderating tonight. And uh, Andy, I don't know if he'll be around, but either me or him will be around. We collect three dollars tuition for the college. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there's a brief announcements period. Then there is the, our main speaker will then speak for a while. After that, we'll have our question and answer period. During the question and answer period, we're going to ask that you ask questions. Because after the question and answer period, you'll each have to get a chance to rebut and make remarks in our infamous rebuttal period. After that, the speaker gets the last word, and you're out of here at 845. There are only two rules that the college operates under. One is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. Yeah. The next speaker is from the Chicago-Cuba Coalition, local affiliate of the National Network on Cuba. This unites groups and individuals to stand for completely normalized relations between Cuba and the United States while publicizing the accomplishments of the Cuban People's Revolution. We stand for free travel between the two countries, ending Washington's economic and regime change warfare as well as its illegal military occupation of Cuba's Guantanamo territory. Everyone interested in these goals, with no dues, restrictions, or requirements demanded, it's more than welcome to get involved. Now, I didn't quite catch our speaker's name, but let's give our speaker... Dan Klein. What is it? Dan Klein. Klein. Dan Klein. 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 Okay. Let's welcome Mr. Dan Klein to the podium. Sorry, sir. Thank you, and wish you a good presentation tonight, sir. Good Cuban Revolution forever changed the Americans. On July 26, 1953, Fidel Castro organized the armed attack on the Moncada Barracks. Is it loud enough? You want to get a little closer to the microphone? I turned it up. Okay, okay just to go ahead. The Batista dictatorship, which was formed in a coup a couple years earlier, had carried out terrible repression against the workers, the peasants, the students, in the years leading up to this, Fidel, Fidel Castro organized a military attack on the garrison, hoping to free the weapons needed for the armed struggle to bring down the Houston dictatorship. It was not successful. Fidel went to jail. Hundreds of his combatants were murdered, tortured. But there was a large campaign for his freedom from prison. And in, in his uh, courtroom speech, history will absolve me, he, will, he, he went over the program of the July 26th movement, the cutting of rents, the elimination of all the racist institutions in Cuba, the elimination of the United States imperialist domination of the economy, land reform for peasants to be able to own the land that they farm. And massive movement took, took place in political organizing in the cities and countryside, and Fidel was freed from prison, together with other combatants that were, that were jailed at the time. And he went to Mexico to organize the guerrilla training that was so fruitful in the years to come to bring down the Batista dictatorship. And Mexico is where he met Che Guevara, who was another leader of the Cuban Revolution. Fidel and his combatants returned to Cuba in 1956, and began the guerrilla struggle in the mountains, which was facilitated uh, by fundraising, by strikes, by organizing in the city of Havana and other cities to bring weapons up to the countryside to carry out sabotage against Batista's uh, military dictatorship. It was a mass movement of the workers and peasants. They set up in the second front, which Raul Castro, Fidel's brother, organized, they set up clinics, not only for the soldiers who got hurt in the battle, but for peasants who had never seen a doctor before. They set up schools, 
uh, where the uh, many of the soldiers who were from, had peasant backgrounds or worker backgrounds never learned to read and write. Uh, were taught to read and write. And the program of the July 26 movement began to be in, uh, I carried out. Question. On January 1st, the revolution triumph, 1959. Batista fled the Dominican Republic, and the uh, soldiers marched into Havana. They disarmed the police. They abolished Batista's army. And a seven-day march was begun from Santiago, the eastern part of the country, all the way to Havana, where Fidel and others stopped and had rallies across the, uh, the, the towns and cities, uh, from Santiago to Havana, where they explained what the revolution was to, what its goals were, what its purpose was, why everyone uh, listening had to be part of the revolution, that it was a revolution uh, for, the, for the people. So a new government came into being. They smashed the old army, they destroyed the old police, and a workers and farmers government came into being, which began the expropriation of US imperialism's uh, domination of the economy, from sugar mills, to the telephone exchange, to the utilities, to the trains. Uh, this infuriated the United States when the Cuban government took these over and put them in the hands of the Cuban people. And that's where the beginning of the hostility, which last to this day, the United States economic embargo against Cuba, which is designed to punish Cuba, to make them pay a price for having overthrown the Batista dictatorship, which was backed by the United States, by the way, uh, and, to, and, to, and to make it harder for the Cuban revolution to succeed with the economic stranglehold of the United States government, which just doesn't apply to US firms trading with Cuba, but United States penalizes to the extent that they can with other countries that, uh, that trade with Cuba in an effort to bring down the revolution. Um, so after they expropriated the US, US imperialist uh, properties, they began a land reform. There were two land reforms in Cuba. Uh, the first one took the land from the biggest landowners and divided it up whether they were based on what the peasants wanted, whether they wanted their own plot of land, whether they wanted to be part of a cooperative, whether they wanted to be part of a state farm. And a second reform, which took over the uh, less, the medium-sized uh, farms and gave land to the peasants, who had never, never benefited from their own work. Under the old system, the peasants did all the work and the landowner got rich. It was a good setup for the landowners and a terrible setup for those who actually did the work. Beaches were segregated under Batista. Blacks couldn't go to the beach. That was eliminated. Women who were relegated to jobs such as nannies, housekeepers, prostitutes, or maybe school teachers were given the opportunity to learn all sorts of skills and become part of the workforce and to become independent. A lot of job training took place, and today, as you may, you may know, the w women are uh, a big percentage of the professional class in Cuba today and participate in construction projects as well and work as uh, welders and cement workers and brick workers, railroading and so forth. The United States, uh, during, the, during the Revolutionary War, the United States, together with some of the Cuban capitalists, tried to buy off the July 26 movement, try to buy off Fidel with promises that they reform this, reform that, as long as they gave the leadership of the struggle to, <clears throat> to the Cuban capitalists, which the July 26 movement and Fidel totally, <clears throat> totally rejected. No sooner had Cuba won their, their revolution and instituted these uh, reforms of expropriating the uh, landowners, the big landowners, and the uh, Cuban capitalists and gave the, the workers the ownership of the factories, the peasants the ownership of the land. Um, then the United States organized an invasion of Cuba to try to bring down the governments and buying them off with, uh, with, with money didn't, didn't work. This was the famous Bay of Pigs uh, invasion in April 1961. Where the socialist character of the revolution was proclaimed at a mass rally that Fidel spoke at. 
uh, where they knew they, were, they knew the attack was coming because the United States planes uh, were bombing the airfields trying to prevent Cuba from being able, being able to defend itself when the, when the invasion came. This is where you might remember Adley Stevenson, who was the UN representative, said, these are not our planes, uh, and denied that the United States was bombing Cuban airports at the time. Well, the idea was that with the invasion, the Cuban people would rise up against the workers and farmers government, would rise up against the Fidel leadership, would rise up against the July 26 movement, and welcome U.S. troops. Well, they weren't U.S. troops, they were mercenaries organized by the U.S. You know, the revolution wasn't for everyone. The capitalists lost, the landowners lost, and they ran to Miami. And they were organized by the CIA, trained in Nicaragua, to come and invade Cuba and bring back the way it was under the Batista dictatorship. Well, in 68 hours, the Cuban, the Cuban militia, the army, and the popular forces in Cuba routed the invaders. And there's a wonderful, a wonderful uh, billboard at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, it's a picture of Fidel on a, next to a tank or on a tank, as part of the military fight against the invaders, saying the first defeat of U.S. imperialism in the Americas. And it's a very popular. Uh, uh, well, this is a uh, museum also at the Bay of Pigs, where you can learn more about the actual fighting that took place and the defeat of the invaders. No, no sooner had Cuba won their, their independence, their socialist revolution, uh, but they extended the hand of solidarity to others fighting for freedom and against oppression throughout the world. They went to uh, uh, Africa and supported the uh, struggle. Um, first it was uh, Ben Bella and his, his fight uh, against uh, French colonialism in Algeria. They took uh, uh, children who were, who were orphaned from the, from the fight. They gave uh, some tanks to Ben Bella uh, in his fight against French colonialism and for independence. Uh, they went to Angola, when they were invaded by the apartheid South African army to try to prevent Angola from winning its independence, uh, which they had struggled for for many years against Portugal, who was the colonial master of, uh, of Angola. They were in Angola for 15 years fighting the supposedly uh, white supremacist, unbeatable, modern South African army which had invaded, like I said before. They fought together. The Angola, the Angola government asked the whole world for help against this invasion. Only Cuba answered. And they did, it didn't take them five minutes to decide to answer. Cuba's revolution wasn't just for Cuba. It was for the world revolution against imperialism and capitalism. And Cuba Cubans volunteer. They don't have a draft when they carry out these international submissions. The Cuban people uh, have a, were changed through the revolution. Instead of thinking about me, 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 and my, 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 and what's in it for me, and stuff like that, they have they gained a social consciousness about them being part of the world, being part of the world struggle against uh, imperialist domination. So they sent uh, troops. Uh, to Angola to fight with the, Ang the, the Angola revolutionary forces who had fought against uh, Portugal. And after 15 years at a famous battle at Quito Quanabal, it definitively defeated uh, the South African army, which led to negotiations uh, for Mandela getting out of prison, the legalization of the African National Congress, Mandela's organization, led to the independence of Namibia, which was owned by uh, South Africa, uh, previously had been owned by uh, Germany. And it was a big, big boost to the fight against apartheid to have the South African army defeated. Uh, when um, Mandela did get out of prison, one of the first places he went was to Cuba to thank Cuba for sending the troops that no one else would to defend Angola's independence and ultimately change the uh, racist apartheid regime in South Africa. So at the plaza of the revolution in Cuba, Mandela uh, said uh, he thanked Fidel, he thanked the Cuban people for their volunteers. He said other countries have come to Africa before to take our diamonds, to take our oil, to take our riches. Cuba came to spill their blood in the fight against racism. And we salute you for that. And Fidel Castro spoke as well. These speeches are available in the back, you should get a copy. Uh, Fidel Castro said, 
Well, of course we fought against the apartheid. Of course we fought against racism. Of course we fought. We are, we are part of an African people. Uh, the, the whole slave trade in, in this history uh, applied to Cuba as well as some other Central American countries in, in, in the United States. And they, uh, Castro said, this is our finest hour. They uh, sent up to 425,000 volunteers over the 15 years. Was it? And this was when the United States was threatening Cuba. And Cuba said, it's more important to make ourselves a little de defenseless by sending our, our resources, our, uh, our tanks, and our, our uh, volunteers to fight against the apartheid army. It changed, as Mandela said, the whole history of South Africa. I could talk for hours about the other internationalist missions that Cuba has carried out. But the other one of note is the Ebola campaign a couple years ago, when Ebola was uh, killing many people in uh, Western Africa. Uh, and uh, the same thing happened. Uh, volunteers, not drafted, not forced, volunteers risked their lives. A very dangerous situation treating Ebola. Uh, but Cuba didn't, the Cuban volunteers didn't think twice about it. They had more volunteers from Cuba than the rest of the world put together, that's for sure. The United States didn't send any doctors. They sent some soldiers to build some barracks for people to stay, but they didn't send any doctors. Well, so Cuba, Cuba continues on this course of internationalism, to see themselves as part of the world, and to fight for the, as part of the, the fight against imperialism and exploitation. They have uh, doctors throughout the world that keep people that have never seen doctors before. The doctors. Uh, live in perhaps dirt floors, no running water, no, no amount of toilets, and the doctors feel so proud that they're able to give medical treatment to those that have never seen a doctor before. And that's a worthwhile life, unlike uh, in the United States, for example, when someone becomes a doctor to play golf in the afternoon and be a prestigious member of the community and so forth and make a lot of money. But, uh, the doctors don't get paid a lot in Cuba. Some people think that's terrible. I think it's great. People don't, people don't uh, pursue the job. If someone doesn't become a medical student in Cuba to make a lot of money, they're not going to make a lot of money. They're going to make a contribution to uh, overcoming the suffering of people, especially in the, in the third world. Um, I've been to Cuba four times, twice recently. Uh, they have, uh, for 14 years now, they've had uh, May Day Brigades. May Day in Cuba is unlike May Day anywhere else in the world. Uh, May Day actually began in Chicago, right, in 1868, with the Haymarket Massacre and so forth. But in Cuba, uh, they have a, 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 a march in Revolution Square where the uh, construction workers are with their hard hats and their unions and stuff on the teachers, the students, uh, all the whole working people, the, uh, the collective uh, farms, the uh, cooperatives and so forth all march under, under banners that will continue the socialist road and uh, Cuba, uh, <coughs> other slogans uh, supporting the, the government and what it's trying to do. The, I was on the brigade for the May Day Brigade with Steve, um, not this May, but the previous May, where we had a banner that said in English and Spanish, uh, end the embargo of Cuba now, end the economic war against Cuba now, uh, U.S. out of Guantanamo now. And we, we held the banner so that people in the march could see it. There was like a viewing stand with about 5,000 of us watching the, uh, the march go by. And people were overjoyed that there is the Chicago Cuba Coalition, which is our name on the bottom of the banner. They waved to us, gave us a clenched fist, the V for victory sign and so forth, to know that they had people from North America that was fighting for the return of Guantanamo and the end of the U.S. embargo. That's what the Chicago Cuba Coalition is about. The Chicago Cuba Coalition is, uh, is about trying to raise awareness that there's not normalization. Obama did not normalize relations with Cuba. Obama is trying to overthrow the Cuban Revolution with other means since the more violent means didn't work. So they got to try something else to accomplish the same thing. Um, where the, the embargo is still in place, the United States continues to occupy part of Cuba, which was taken from Cuba, what, a hundred and something years ago, uh, 
uh, when the United States uh, stepped in after the Spanish were defeated, took over Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, and, and Guam. Uh, so there's a military base, on, a U.S. military base on Cuban soil. This is outrageous. And they want the return of the Guantanamo Bay. It negatively impacts the uh, fishing, fish, fishermen who live in the area and, and other, uh, I mean, if you just look at a map, you can figure out what's the injustices with the United States having a military base uh, in Cuba. It's an insult to the Cubans. And actually, uh, there's a, uh, a check, I'm not sure how much it's for, that the United States government sends to Cuba every month to pay for the rent of Guantanamo, which the Cuban government refuses to cash. They don't want to legitimatize the uh, occupation of part of Cuban like territory. How much? It's like a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars a month. <coughs> so, uh, I, the other brigade I was on uh, last year was the Che Brigade. It was the 50th anniversary of the return of Che's remains who died in combat in Bolivia trying to spread the socialist revolution. Uh, he, he died in 1967 in, in Bolivia uh, with this, by the Bolivian Army uh, in cooperation with the CIA and they, his remains had stayed in Bolivia. And, 50 years ago, they returned his remains as part of the uh, tribute to Che Guevara that exists in Cuba here. And it was the 50th anniversary was a big celebration of that, the role that Che Guevara played in a volunteer work where when Che was alive and working as part of the Cuban government, uh, Che organized uh, on Sundays, red, what they call the Red Sundays, where people who, without pay, would come together in a community and fix up the school or fix up the apartment or uh, fix up the road or something like that, where people uh, volunteer. We volunteered, it wasn't obligatory, but people wanted to collectively solve the problem. Maybe the apartment they were fixing up wasn't yours, but it needed repair. Maybe the road wasn't the street that your house is on. But that was the, kind of the new consciousness, that what Che called the new men and women that's created out of a of a revolution where instead of doing me and my my, it's what we can do to solve the problems of, of working people. Okay, um, just to repeat the announcement that Steve made tomorrow, Miguel Fraga uh, from the United from the Cuban Embassy in Washington D.C. will be speaking at the uh, reception type thing at the Humboldt Park boat, Boathouse at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. At chance to meet. What is it? 1301 North Humboldt Drive. So it's a chance to hear uh, from a Cuban diplomat on the, what's going on in Cuba today and um, the history of the Cuban Revolution. So the um, Chicago Cuba Coalition will be organizing another delegation uh, to go to the next May Day. It's a ways away, but if anyone here is interested in visiting Cuba, the brigades are, diff are not, not for tourists. It's not, uh, you don't stay in a five-star hotel, you stay in a camp. Uh, you, st you stay in a room with uh, eight bunk beds, no hot water. We do agricultural work in the morning as part of the farm cooperatives. Uh, we visit the, the museums. We participate in the May Day uh, march and demonstration. And we get to visit with, uh, uh, in different factories, in different uh, hospitals and uh, be able to talk to people on the street on the day off and so forth. So it's, uh, it's uh, something that the uh, ECAP, the Institute of Friendship for the Peoples, which is the Cuban organization which encourages people to come to Cuba and learn, learn about the Cuban Revolution. And the last couple of times, it was only 600, and, 600 or $700 to, to go. Uh, and it's a re tremendously rewarding experience to learn what a difference a revolution makes. That Cuba has has what it has today with the education, the medical, and so forth, which they're kind of famous for. That's all happening because of a revolution that took place, uh, which triumphed in January 1st, 1959, where the workers and peasants took power. So you can talk to me or Steve, actually, who's the coordinator of the Chicago Cuba Coalition, if you'd like to receive information on the uh, next brigade coming up from, from May Day. It's part of an international uh, brigade. People who were there from 29 different countries on the one that I was in. So there's people from Africa, Latin America, North America, and so forth, who are all supporters of the Cuban Revolution that stay at this camp. There's about 300 of us. And uh, the whole thing is translated, so for people like me, Spanish is 
that negligible. And I understand what's being said in those <coughs> meetings that take place with different uh, women's organizations, the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, and so forth. Okay, I'll stop here. Oh, one more thing. In the back table, there's, you can find a lot of books in Cuba, I Fidel, by Che, and others. Uh, so thank you very much for. You have, you have a lot more time right now. Please, 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 uh, is the national conference of the national network on Cuba, which is open to anyone and everyone who is interested in Cuba and, and defending norm, uh, you know, normalization. So it's uh, October 10th and 11th in uh, the Twin Cities. So uh, y'all welcome to come. Twin Cities of what? Minnesota. Minnesota. And St. Paul. Minnesota, Minnesota St. Paul. Can you talk more about yeah. I happened to live through that. My dad was with the staff. Yeah. We were, uh, as a family, we were afraid that. Uh, and they, and they, one more, she said. We never saw my dad again. So, repeat the question. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. She wants to talk more about Bay of Pigs. Okay. Who got killed, right? Or? Yeah, I can just say a little something about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned before that the Cuban Revolution wasn't for everyone. Some people lost. They lost their casinos. huge plot of land. They lost their factory that they owned. They lost, lost their sugar refinery. The doctors weren't going to be uh, living up here where the peasants living down here anymore. So some doc doctors left my, <coughs> Miami, thinking that they'd be returned one day and be able to have it like it used to be under Batista. So these are, these are the people that the CIA organized. Brigade 2506, or is it 08? I forget. Brigade 2506 or 08 was the, was the name of the brigade that was organized by the CIA that did military training in Nicaragua to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, which is the southern part of the island. They chose that because it's a very remote area, swamp, swamp lands. Not very many people live in there and so forth, so they thought they could establish a beachhead and that the Cuban people, would, they would declare themselves the new government, that was the idea, and um, the idea was that the Cuban people would rise up against uh, the new, new revolutionary government headed by Fidel Castro. It didn't work out that way. Uh, they, uh, I'm not sure the exact number that were killed on the, from, the, from the invaders, 2506, but there's a, on the, on the billboard that I mentioned, there's another billboard next to it that has the names and the occupations of the people who invaded. And there are bankers and factory owners and big landowners and so forth. I think there's one out of uh, about a thousand that was a uh, peasant or a worker. And a number of the invaders were captured. And uh, the Cuban government negotiated with the United States they, all, all these people would be returned to Miami in exchange for medical supplies of some sort. But all the people were returned to Miami, but the medical supplies never arrived. Oh, really? That's not known. Huh. That's difficult. So they didn't imprison anybody? No. They, re they ended up returning all the prisoners to Miami. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, you've been to Cuba four times. I've been there three. But obviously we're, you know, with different venues. Do you believe that Cuba is actually a free and democratic society? The question is, is Cuba a free and democratic society? Well, Cuba isn't run by the billionaires. There are no capitalists in Cuba. Cuba has more freedom than we have in this country here or other capitalist countries because the, 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 the factories and the land is not owned by individuals who produce for profit. It's, they have an economic plan that uh, takes into account the needs of the country as a whole, and production is based on what's needed for the people rather than what makes what's profitable. Uh, there have been uh, many, many more. How many people here have heard of the Cuban Five? The Cuban Five? There's a gentleman over here. The United States didn't stop its aggression against Cuba to try to bring down the government and make things much more difficult 
with the defeat of the Bay of Pigs. There's been many, and not only the United States uh, has an aggressive attitude towards Cuba, trying to uh, overthrow the government, but the Cuban exiles who lost in the revolution, they've organized their own speedboats to go by the beaches and shoot up people who are getting, you know, swimming in the ocean. They planted bombs in hotels in downtown Havana. Uh, who were they? The Cuban Five? No, the Cuban, I'll get to the Cuban Five in a minute. These are, uh, these are counter-revolutionaries who carry out uh, violent attacks against Cuba with bombings. There was an airliner uh, that left from Venezuela where a bomb was put on it and blew up in the sky, uh, killing 57? 79. 79, thanks, Steve. 79 people on board. So this, this is just one, ex one example. The Helms-Burton Act, uh, which uh, penalizes any other country that trades with Cuba, that they can't come to the United States for years and years. These are all designed to, to, to block the progress of the Cuban Revolution, to make it more difficult, to try to starve them out, to try to squeeze them. In Cuba, uh, they have workplace assemblies that debate new laws. They have elections in Cuba for their equivalent of a parliament, a congress, and so forth, uh, where you're nominated by your co-workers. Um, Pritzker and Rauner uh, are, are the candidates because they're billionaires. Or other candidates from the Democrats, Republicans, in my opinion, get financed by the billionaires and represent their interests. Uh, that doesn't happen in Cuba. They don't have the role of money in elections. So yes, I think that uh, Cuba eliminated the dictatorship uh, of capital. They eliminated the rule of the big businesses and put it in the hands of the workers and the peasants. And uh, yeah, Cuba is a place where the working people have some say in the running of the society, unlike here. Did you ever vote to send troops to Afghanistan? Did you ever vote to invade Iraq? Did you ever vote for any, any did you ever vote for layoffs? You ever vote for the prices going up? I just got to tell you a, a personal story. When, when, uh, one of the last four gates that I was on. So we were in a relatively small town in, in Cuba. Uh, it was hot. But we stopped by, you know, we were given total free time. Uh, we went here and there. Including we uh, stopped by the communist, well, there was the, the CTC, the Workers uh, Union headquarters. We stopped by there, and then we stopped by the Communist Party headquarters. It's a little, you know, storefront, whatever. Talked with people there, you know, it was, it was all good. And we went down, and we're, we're still killing some time, because, you know, bus it isn't leaving for, like, another couple hours. We go to a little small store. We're talking with people there. We started talking to you know one of the guys who was there is a Cuban guy and he's like uh, you guys are you must you know guys people from the United States uh, yeah it was like man let me tell you I hate this fucking country like fuck Cuba I want to go to the United States man like this place is terrible well standing right next to him is the woman who's the secretary of the Communist Party of the, you know, of the little town. And you know he knows who she is. And he had no problem speaking his mind. No problem. He said his shit. You know, whether he's right or not, but the main thing is he had no problem speaking his mind right in front of the, the uh, leader of the Congress the dictatorial communist part. So that's the way things are in Cuba. Okay. There's another person who was on the last brigade, Dean Hazelwood in the back. Would you uh, like him to come feel, up and feel say Feel free it. to make a comment if you like to, Dean. Come on up and say a few words if you're here. Okay. Just have some time. In the, in the back, Charlie? Yeah, Dan, I, in the news this week, there were reports that something like 3,000 people died due to the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico. But I understand they had hurricanes even worse that hit Cuba and 
I don't think anybody was even discomforted or something. Do you know anything about that? Yes, they, I know a lot about like that. They, they, the capitalists, uh, the socialists, and the little brother. Many, many of these hurricanes hit Haiti, some hit the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba. Uh, the one that devastated Puerto Rico, Maria, also hit Cuba. But if you look at the figures of how many people die in these hurricanes, the number in Cuba is usually zero, maybe one or two, where in the other islands it's dozens or hundreds. And Haiti is way up there. And there's a reason why. It has to do with the revolution Cuba made. Because in Cuba, you're not left on your own. In Cuba, when the hurricane is on its way, the government, the unions, the women's organizations, the committees for defense of the revolution, all organize to get people out of harm's way to facilities where there's beds, TVs, and food. And you can take your pet if you want to. The hurricane comes and does its damage, and people are organized to move back to their, their, their houses, their apartments. And the government helps, and the unions help with rebuilding the damage that was done. Santiago was, was really hit hard in the last hurricane, the eastern part of the island. In, in uh, <coughs> other islands, and in the United States as far as that goes, well, there's a hurricane coming, or sometimes not. Uh, you're on your own, we suggest you evacuate. We're on the highways get clogged. In Houston, for example, you couldn't get, couldn't get out of the city. You're, you're on your own. Good luck. Uh, the society doesn't exist and organize to take people's uh, well-being into, into consideration. And that's why the figures are the, the way uh, Charlie said. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were 29 American diplomats to Cuba who lost their, some of their, a lot of their hearing plus mental uh, damage. To, uh, to, and uh, it's because some, some kind of sonic device was aimed at them and these American diplomats, and because of that, uh, the United States government drew a lot of the people, out, uh, the diplomats, out of the embassy. Now, who who aimed this device at, at these Americans? Was that Cuba? Was it Russia? Who, who's doing this? No one knows. The, you know, the Cuba opened up and said for the FBI to come in and work with Cuba to find out what was the source of people having this uh, ear problem, like and mental health away. problem, and. Uh, so Cuba was interested in finding out the answer to this, as was the FBI apparently, although the <coughs> Cubans shared it, what other information they had from their experts and engineers and technicians and so forth with the FBI. The FBI didn't do, didn't do likewise. But the United States uh, government doesn't know the source of the problem, and Cuba, Cuban government doesn't know the source of the problem, and it's a, it's a mystery at this point. What is so wrong? about the United States and its system. <laughs> well, so I'm going to invite me back and I'll talk on that. Just briefly. First World War, Second World War, Nagasaki. Ku Klux Klan, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, lynchings, unemployment. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can go here. Over here. Over here. Over here. I wonder if you'd mind talking about the problem of currency exchange in Cuba, and you know the uh, and and the problem of uh, poverty and how it's handled. Because I heard there's quite a bit of prostitution, yep. and I'm wondering if you'd make a comment about poverty and currency exchange and the need for American dollars and what people will do to get them. Well. U.S. dollars can't be, the, the embargo prevents the normal use of your credit, you can't use your credit card because of the embargo, you can't use dollars, you change, you have to change your money when you get there to coops they call it, C-U-C, and you use that. Cuba is no paradise. Cuba was a third world country with a legacy of domination by U.S. imperialism. Uh, the blockade hurts in a million and one ways. The, uh, the wages are, are not uh, are not high. That's for sure. Most people make thirty dollars. But what there is is a certain minimum. You don't see people sleeping in the streets. You don't see homelessness in Cuba. 
there is poverty, there is, har there is hardship. And because of the effects of the blockade, which contributes to this in a major way, um, pe some people look for individual <coughs> ways out, and prostitution being one of those. But prostitution is nothing like it was when they had the casinos and, you know, that was a playground for the, for the U.S. imperialists before the victory of the Cuban Revolution, where prostitution was uh, totally, you know, abounded in Havana especially. But there is, there is some prostitution in this, this hardship. That's why we fight to end the embargo, so that Cuba can, can, can be, be a more normal country and be able to, to trade. Cuba's a little island. They don't have any, they need oil that they have to pay market prices for. They don't have oil in, uh, in Cuba. They've got a few, uh, a few mines, but they don't have a lot of resources. They have to trade at the world market, and the embargo makes them pay uh, you know, three, four, or five times the regular price that it would be without the embargo. So that's a big part of why the Chicago Cuba Coalition uh, fights to end the embargo. I just wanted to share something with you. I, I was uh, in uh, New Orleans with uh, my kids, my three kids. Um, we actually uh, we did a bunch of stuff, had a good time. Uh, one of the things we did was uh, went to a slave plantation, you know, an old slave plantation. And we heard, you know, the manor and all the rest of it. And then, you know, most of the shacks were gone because they, you know, pretty rotten. You know, they weren't up to begin with, but they, you know, they had one or two left. Anyway, I was standing up there in the, you know, in the, in the big mansion with the, with the high ceilings to keep everything cool, looking down at, at a couple of the shacks, and I kind of had this epiphany, which is, uh, here's the deal about Cuba. The world is just like that plantation. The big wealthy people control everything. Germany, United States, you know, whatever, you fill it all in. All the imperialist countries have all the wealth. They got the air conditioning, they got the, you know, everything you want. And then the, the rest of the world in Africa, a lot of Asia, etc. They're like the people living in the shacks. What, what Cuba did, they freed their shack. Master can't come into that shack and rape the woman. Master can't come into that shack and take the children away and sell them down there. Oh, you want an ice cream? I thought you were rich. Master can't come in and beat that man. But it's, so it's a free shack, <laughs> but it's still a shack, all right? Imperialism still exists. Plantation is still there. Cuba's a free shack. I hope that might be useful. What about all the crime in, in Cuba? Yeah. So we don't yeah, have I wanted to hear. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> yeah. answer the question. One question I wanted to say a little bit more about, that's what, who the Cuban five were. In view of the many ways that uh, violent attacks have been carried out against Cuba, not only by the U.S. government, but by the counter-revolutionaries in Miami, Cuba sent five people to Miami to infiltrate these groups to find out when the next attack was coming so they could tip off Cuba and prevent deaths and property damages. For this, they were arrested by the U.S. government under Jimmy Carter. Yeah, yeah. No, under Clinton. Under Clinton. Right. Um, 1998. And they were charged with stealing U.S. military secrets and conspiracy and all sorts of stuff. They spent they spent up to 16 years in prison. One of the things the Chicago Cuba Coalition did at, during those years, they were they were freed. The last one was freed um, and. 2014 uh, and returned as heroes to Cuba. But they uh, conducted themselves honorably in the courtroom, said that they'd do it all over again, trying to protect human lives and human property from uh, attacks like this. And Cuba Five defense committees were set up all over the world to publicize the, the jailing of these people who were trying to protect Cuba. And uh, the United States government labeled them terrorists and normal. Uh, 
but we won their freedom. They're back in Cuba and carrying out different assignments in uh, government or in the, in the farms that they that they live in. But it was a big campaign for 16 years that uh, put enough pressure on the U.S. government that they finally uh, finally freed them. One of them was given a double life sentence plus 15 years, Antonio Guerrero, because what, what happened a, a year or two earlier was planes from Miami were, were violating Cuban airspace, dropping leaflets about how people should rise up to overthrow the government. The Cuban government warned. There were Brothers to the Rescue was the name of the group. Say Balsura was the, the main organizer of it. And they warned the Brothers to the Rescue that if you keep violating Cuban airspace, we're going to shoot you down. And they kept violating Cuban airspace. And they were shot down. Well, they, they blamed Antonio Guerrero for knowledge that this was going to happen. And so they gave him a double life sentence plus 15 years. He was, he was uh, one of the leaders of the, of the Cuban Five who was, uh, was one of the last ones freed. I'd like to say a word about meeting uh, Raul Castro's son, the nephew of Fidel Castro, Alejandro Castro. Uh, I'm Greek. Every 10 years I go to Greece. Uh, to leaving, coming on the boat in 1946 to the USA. So I was there in uh, January 2015 in Athens, and I saw on Greek television tonight there's going to be a speech and a book talk by Alejandro Castro. And he was a uh, uh, guest on the Greek television news. So I went over to this event and there was four or five hundred people. It was really packed, a big auditorium there, a theater actually, in downtown Athens. And uh, it impressed me. It's a man, a very well-dressed uh, gentleman, uh, middle-aged from uh, Angola. He got up to thank uh, the Cubans and especially Alejandro Castro, all an uh, impressive young man about 40 years old. That's Raul's son. He and he says, We are grateful to you for coming. Okay, may I remind? Us in our liberation struggle. And then question. later, I, I met uh, All right. Andrew and I Where's found the out that he Where's the question? had uh, uh, damage to his eye, I think, fighting in the front lines in Angola. Is that right? We're going to go some ice cream. No. I, I don't know the particulars. I, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Said. Um, one of the things they embargoed the was pesticides and uh, insecticides. And Cuba went to organic farming, and I'd wonder if you would talk about that. Well, the two brigades I was on recently, we worked in um, cooperatives that had organic farms. And um, this was originally done on a necessity during what's called the special period, when their um, chemicals that they use for fertilizer wasn't available. And so they continued in a big way to do the, or, the organic, the organic farms. They had, they have a lot of farms in the city, you know, small little farms on the, uh, in, the in the neighborhoods and stuff that originally came into being during the special period. Special period refers to what 1990, 91, when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and 80 percent of Cuba's trade was gone overnight, and it was very hard times in Cuba. Uh, there was uh, people scrounging for food. Stuff like that, and so that's where they turned to the um, community gardens and, and to, to try to grow food that they used to import. Um, but yeah, you know, the farms that we worked on were organic farms. We pulled wheat, we planted yucca, we moved, we moved um, rocks from the fields that got in the way of the crops and stuff. Like that. Cuba is, is the most has more organic farming than any country in the world. Hmm. Yeah, I just, a couple of questions, kind of what, I'm interested in your background and, um, you know, how you got into this and also, um, you know, how, what works, what needs to be done, you know, um, like I, I thought things were maybe a little better under Carter and, um, and maybe Obama, um, but, you know, I think the CIA is uh, a big problem. I'm trying to figure out how to, 
get rid of them. Um, but I, you know, is there is there any way to organize the world community uh, to expose the uh, really crimes against humanity of the CIA as a covert operation that's been operating since Hitler? You know, um, they're still using the same dirty tricks. And uh, I mean, has there been any organizing of Russia or the community? You know, of people who are being oppressed by. I mean, you said there's a lot of examples where Cuba helped others, but um, I don't know. Is there a way we can help Cuba, or you're helping Cuba through your coalition, um, you know, and helping the world? Well, the Chicago-Cuba Coalition organizes the brigades. That's a very important way to help Cuba because you get to learn firsthand and have your own experience and then can share that with others. That's, that's part of the thing. Uh, we have public meetings sometimes. Um, where representatives from Cuba come and we have a meeting at the Working United or SEIU or a church where people can learn about the Cuban, uh, the Cuban Revolution and spread the word. We've had a couple of things downtown at the federal building, demanding the United States end the embargo and get out of Guantanamo. We have our banner, we pass on flyers, informational flyers to people getting off work in the late afternoon. Uh, but the, the embargo uh, has been in place for what, 10 different presidents? None of them. Have, uh, we have the embargo right now. We had it under, we had it under Obama. We had it under Carter. They didn't. They didn't do any. Oh, Clinton, Clinton was the one that arrested the Cuba Five. who are trying to protect Cuba from violent attacks. So I don't look to the Democratic Republican parties for any help with the Cuban Revolution. That's my opinion. Sorry, I can't restrain myself, but I, I just have to say. Cuba is the example of what can be done. Cuba has more teachers per capita, more doctors per capita than any country in the world. They have more land under preservation than any country in the world. Not only yet, they have the highest literacy rate in the world. But they're not just trying to like build a nice house in the suburbs for themselves. They're trying to change the world themselves. As Dan said, they, they sent over 400,000 volunteers to Angola, who fought 2,000 of them, died. <laughs> Cuba is the example of what can be done. And that's why the US government, in all its, both its parties, hates Cuba because it is the example of everything is quite solvable as long as you, well, you got to overthrow the capitalists. If you do that, you can achieve what Cuba has accomplished. And you look at what Cuba has accomplished as a very poor country, a shack, you can imagine what we could accomplish here. Did you saw did you saw some Russians in Cuba and from former Soviet Union? Who do you see the Russians? How they doing? Did they really settle over there? If they wealthy or not? Or what's your opinion about Russia? Well, I didn't. There were no Russians on the brigade. Two recent brigades I was on. There was a couple people from Ukraine, but there were no Russians, so I can't really. Uh, yeah. Uh, somebody had asked for yeah. some examples of what's wrong with the United States, and one of the first things the guy said was World War II. And I was wondering if you could explain that. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand. Wow. Okay, I'll give you my opinion. The Chicago Cuba Coalition doesn't have a position on World War II, so I'll give you, I'll give you my position. Um, the Second World War, and U.S. participation in it, was not for freedom and democracy and the poor Jews and the, uh, being against anti-Semitism. It was about German imperialism taking over some of the colonies, taking over different spheres of influence that the United States, France, Britain had. It was for a redivision of the world. It was, going, it was going to be the new masters of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. There was a boat of 500 Jews outside Miami trying to escape the, the Holocaust, the United States turned them back. 
the Socialist Workers' Party that I'm a member of had 18 of its leaders sent to prison during the Second World War for their political views in opposition to the war. Lynchings were taking place during the war. The war was the soldiers were segregated. The war was about the imperialists fighting among themselves on, on a new redivision of the world. It was fascist forces here in the United States that raised their ugly head during the uh, late 30s. There was, uh, there was different aspects to the war. The war uh, that Germany did against the Soviet Union was, not, was, a, was a war to try to bring back uh, the, the capitalists that were located in 1917. I know, they just can't fight it. Uh, Chinese were fighting against Japanese colonialism for their independence and freedom, which they won. Uh, the United States was not happy about, quote, how did we lose China uh, when China became independent from Japan? And uh, plans were underway for U.S. troops in the Pacific to go into China and try to bring back the way it was before, but the soldiers revolted. Let, let, let's have a forum on that. That's a whole different issue. That it would be really interesting. Yeah. It would be great if you guys saw yeah. it. Can you tell me a little bit about the, why the Russians brought in the nukes, I mean the, the missiles? Was that basically as a defense against the Bay of Pigs? <coughs> Good question. It's about the uh, what's known in the United States as the Missile Crisis, which happened in 1962, in October, a year, a year after the Bay of Pigs. The United States did not give up on their plans to invade Cuba after they were defeated in 1961 April. 1960, following their defeat at the Bay of Pigs, they still had the same idea in mind. They were preparing to go into uh, into Cuba again with another armed expedition to try to accomplish the overthrow of the government. And the, uh, at, at that time, the, Uni the United States had uh, missiles, uh, nuclear missiles, surrounding the Soviet Union. And uh, Khrushchev suggested to Castro that they put missiles in Cuba, kind of like, uh, the, the, yeah, okay. So uh, the Cuban government said uh, yes, but they wanted to make it public that they were doing this. Well, Khrushchev didn't want to do that, so missiles were brought in, and the uh, so-called missile crisis took place. At the end of it, Fidel said he knew that it was going to remain a secret because what happened was the United States sent uh, uh, reconnaissance flights over and said, hey, there's, there's missiles here aimed at the United States and so forth. The missiles were there not to invade the United States, but they were there to help prevent the United States invading again. But Fidel said it was a big mistake not to do it openly and publicly exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it because it seemed like the Cuba had something to hide. Way it was done, and the Cuban, uh, the Russians pulled the missiles out without ever consulting Fidel. But Fidel thought it was a <laughs> retrospect that it was a fiasco that he wouldn't repeat again. I have a question. Is was the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs related to operations north? North? Do you know about that? Yes. You do. What would, can you tell us, Carl, what Operation Northwoods was and how it was planned? Please. Oh, Northwoods. So Northwoods was part of the whole, you know, efforts to overthrow the Cuban Revolution uh, in the course of it. But I feel that what you speak probably about this yeah. more than I. What was the plan? Uh, well, one of the plans was to, uh, they included uh, many different provocations, including for shooting yeah. down a U.S. international yeah. airplane. That is, U.S. government shooting down a U.S. passenger plane and then claiming Cuba. But why you know more? The point was, Operations Northwood was a false flag operation that was planned to kill a bunch of people in Miami and blame it on Cuba. You kill a bunch of your own people, like you did on 9-11, and blame it on the country that you want to invade. And President Kennedy didn't go along with killing a bunch of people in Miami. And that's one of the reasons he was probably eliminated. So, yeah, this is part of the Cuban history that we never hear in the mainstream media. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Oh, well. The red shirt. Yeah. Could you elaborate more on the uh, economics of Cuba? Generally, what does a socialist country do to generate capital or, or income? You know, how, how does it work? <coughs> Can you have, 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 have say something about it? Well, the, 
the resources of the country are is organized by a plan, economic plan, that the Odea you know, Popular, the parliament has to say over, and the, the government plans for them. what what what's to be produced, how much of what's going to be produced, how it gets distributed, and so forth. <coughs> and the the work, the some the, the jobs are there. The work needs to be done to grow food. You need farmers for that. Actually, they need more farmers to grow food today because uh, some of the college graduates take, who take advantage of the excellent education system are not interested in farming and they're trying to recruit them to, to be farmers because that's what the country, the country needs right now. And they do, uh, they put aside a certain amount of the wealth that's produced for scientific works. Uh, they're very famous for their uh, bio, uh, biology and technology and biotech technology institutes. They have a, I hear they have a, a, a cure for uh, for a type of uh, cancer that the embargo doesn't allow to come into the United States. And they, they, they're cutting, cutting edge on a number of things. They've done uh, a lot of work in third world countries with, uh, with cataract, uh, with cataract, cataract problems with the eyes. But it's a, they have, they have a, a certain amount of individual proprietorship where people can open up a restaurant in their house and a little bar and B and B. &B um, and some taxis, I think, for private and stuff. But these are these are ways to try to stimulate the economy, which uh, suffers again because of the economic blockade. It's not like you need capitalists to have jobs. Jobs are, exist when work needs to be done: building roads, building buildings, building schools, educating young people, scientific research, growing food, distributing food, transportation system, get the railroad going again. Can, can we go there and go to school or work the farms? Are we allowed to immigrate there? Well, right now, if you want to go, go to Cuba, you have to get a license, which is easier today than it was in the past, for sure. You know, what the brigade that I was on recently, what the, let's call it people to people license, and uh, you under under the guise of Learning, learning about what's going on in Cuba and visiting different uh, public institutions, so you can get a, a visa to go to Cuba. I don't know about uh, permanently living there. I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I was just known from my personal experience on, on the brigades, which are just uh, two weeks long. I just want to say uh, one last thing, which is. Uh, I always stay at this uh, apartment of the guy who was the head of the black guy, Cuban, was the head of the Cuban space mission. Great guy, you know, I mean, Cuba said the first black woman uh, in space. Uh, so anyway, the, you know, we were, we were talking and uh, somebody asked this, it wasn't me. Somebody asked him a question, like, well, you're a space guy, so if there were like a, you know, a, a UFO from another planet that came and, and flew around the world, how, how would they know that Cuba had had a socialist revolution that was different? And man, he didn't miss a beat. He said, because everybody will be, everybody is in meetings. <laughs> everybody is in meetings. In Cuba? Everybody is in meetings because that's the way things happen in Cuba. Right now they're, 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 they're redoing their uh, constitution. There's going to be six, you know, 150,000 meetings in Cuba to discuss everything. Yeah, it's, it's democracy, like real democracy. <laughs> Hope that was interesting. So, mm -hmm. anyone who hasn't already asked a question, I, I think not. So, we'll go a second round. Yeah, um, Raul Castro has resigned, <coughs> and there's going to be a new leadership. Could you tell me anything about the new leadership? The person that's uh, going to be prime minister. Thank you. Person? He had a position as a provincial head of the Communist Party. I don't remember which province it was. He's been in a, a, 
Raul's moved to um, the eastern part of the island. But it remains to be seen what, what, uh, what leadership qualities he has and so forth. But he's been a, uh, a leader of the Communist Party now for many, many years. So I don't really have a lot of support to say on that. But here. Are you, are you said that Cuba had a, a very high rate of literacy. How could that be if it's a third world country? And is this fake news? I, I don't know. Excellent question. Cuba, uh, after the conquering of power, uh, recognized that many people, especially those in the countryside, couldn't read and write. So they did a voluntary literacy campaign where they recruited over 100,000 young people, mainly high school students, and some college students, and others who knew how to read and write, to go to the countryside, to live with the family for a month, six weeks, uh, work with them uh, during the day, and have school at night, and learn how to read and write. And they did what no other country has ever done. They virtually eliminated illiteracy in one year, which is what Fidel Castro at the United Nations announced was the plan, and was accomplished. And. Uh, it's one of the great accomplishments of the Cuban Revolution. And they, and they did that, thought it was so important, because how can you be a, a, a citizen of the world? How can you participate and know what's going on in the world? How can you know about politics? How can you have a view on things if you can't read and write? To read, to read books, to learn history, to learn what's going on in the world. So it was a high priority, and the, uh, the schools shut down uh, during the literacy campaign. The high school all shut down, uh, and then they had to to come back to school and make up a semester of work to be a little more intense when they got back to school because they had been out of the, uh, the educational system to teach others to read and write. But it was, a, it was a very educational experience for many of those in the city that didn't know what rural life was like. Living on, you know, with uh, no running water and stuff like that. So they, had, they, they learned about the countryside, the problems of the countryside, as well as shared their knowledge of, uh, of reading and writing. So they had like training sessions and stuff like that before they went out there. But there was a, a woman uh, who just toured Chicago about six, eight months ago, uh, who was seven years old. She volunteered, but her parents, of course, wouldn't let her leave home, so she taught someone in the neighborhood, an elderly gentleman, to read and write. And uh, she, she, she spoke here in Chicago at a number of different places of the Cuban Revolution and the literacy campaign. But it's world known, so it's, it's worldwide known and recognized. The success of the literacy campaign that they did that brought them a higher literacy rate than any Latin American country, that's for sure. In the back. How many books did Cuba ban? Zero that I know of. I didn't see any book burnings or anything like that. Ban. Ban. Same thing. Yeah. Ban, burn. I don't know of any books that are banned. Do you? <laughs> there are ba books that are banned in the United States. I <laughs> bet they didn't allow any of the Ayn Rand books. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dean. He was on the last brigade. I, I first went to Cuba in, in 1991, at the beginning of the special period. Um, and I, I saw one of the last uh, Soviet freighters come in. And even at that time, um, things were very tough, very tough indeed. They'd parked up all the tractors, all the fields were being plowed by oxen, uh, which if you've ever tried that, that's extremely hard work. Um, the citrus and, and all of that, as somebody said before, they were experimenting in double cropping um, and all this organic stuff. Not because they wanted to, but that's because the only, that was the only way to produce this stuff. Um, then I went back uh, this last May, and now they've all got brand new tractors. Um, they've made huge advances in genetics and um, all the agriculture stuff, and they do it. Uh, they do it completely ethically. We had all these greenies on this trip who know about this stuff, and it's like if they change anything, they always keep the original because of all the bugs. That we don't we don't know anything about these bugs. We, we, we're not. So they they keep all the originals. It's it's very ethically done in there. Um, but in, in, in terms of uh, one thing that a couple of us did on, on one of the days off when you get let loose in Havana and told to go and talk to anyone was we went to a mosque 
and uh, spoke to some of the people there about the history of the uh, Muslim people coming to Cuba. Um, and now they have this mosque there and a museum and everything. And then we went and found a, um, what's the Jewish church called? Synagogue. We haven't found a synagogue. <coughs> now there's, every year there's a vote in the United Nations. This is what struck me about it. Every year there's a vote in the United Nations um, on the embargo. And the U.S. always loses this. Uh, they, in fact, last year they abstained and they had nobody voting with them. On the embargo. Every, everybody votes that it's a, illegal and they should stop it. Um, the one country that consistently votes with the United States in, in favor of the embargo is Israel. This synagogue had Israeli flags all over it, not touched. No, no, you wouldn't even, no security, nothing. We walked into it. We just walked into it on a Saturday, on the Sabbath. So, you know, people have this idea. The way that US imperialism talks about Cuba is that it's like some oppressive Stalinist state. Nothing like it. Nothing at all. You talk about banning of books? No. They insist on having the Bible and the Quran and that and the libraries. They're not scared of any of that stuff. The, um, I heard somebody raise crime before too, which made me laugh. Here we are sitting in Chicago talking about crime in, in, in Cuba or anywhere else. The, the corruption is so open, it's just rife here. So all of the United States, every capitalist country is like that. Not in, not in Cuba. Not in Cuba. They found a general who was trading in diamonds and stuff in the Angola War. They had a trial. He was put on trial and he was executed. And Roll, he was a friend of Rolls. And Roll said, we had just signed a warrant to execute a couple of rank and file soldiers who had raped a couple of women in Angola. So this general, who was their leader, was involved in all this dirty stuff and drugs. What else could we do? It's, it's their morals and ours. It's the most moral country you can think of. One other, people talk about the stuff in the world. One other thing that nobody's mentioned is when Chernobyl blew up, Cuba took thousands of kids that were victims from the Ukraine. Thousands of kids took them to Cuba and helped to fix them up. At no cost to them. Nobody ever talks about that. Question. D, D, D. The big question everybody thinks about now is, uh, is Cuba about to become, become capitalism? Gonna go with China, bro. Is that what's going on in Cuba? I say, I say lift the embargo and let the Cubans decide. I've got a lot of confidence in the working class of Cuba. <laughs> How can you lift the embargo? How can we get that done? We've got a joint coalition. Well, that's what the goal of the Chicago Cuba Coalition and other coalitions like that. United States and throughout the world exists to put pressure on the, uh, the vote in the United Nations on uh, condemning the United States embargo comes up over November, October, October. and undoubtedly there will be demonstrations around the country demanding that uh, the United States end the embargo. So I encourage you to join us whether we're downtown at the federal building or having a public meeting to denounce the U.S. embargo and enough uh, you know, public pressure put on the government to force them to do what they don't really want to do. Would we be able to do a forum like this in Havana, Cuba, with all of our views being spread without fear of government retribution? Well, Steve gave a story. We do this all the time. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. You have a meeting like this and different viewpoints being. There's all sorts of debates. All right. right. So, no, shut all right. right. Uh, Trying to make this quick, but uh, so in the U.S., like in terms of uh, exercising your democratic rights, like okay, if you hand out leaflets, yeah, you're probably gonna be okay. 
if you try to sell a newspaper, oh, yeah. uh, maybe start running into some police problems. Um, if you're petitioning, that's actually at the top of it. You could probably get away with that. But if you set up a table with books, the cops will be on your ass in this country. Like, <laughs> you will be in, in serious, Cuba? in serious trouble. So in Cuba, for, for this is this is the United States I'm talking about. So the, really? the, the, you can get away with petitioning, kind of, we can't do books. and then maybe handing out leaflets, and then uh, maybe selling a newspaper. But then, yeah, books, no. That's the U.S. That's the U.S. What about Cuba? Cuba. So the first time I went there. I was at, uh, it was like the 30th anniversary of the Tricontinental Tri Congress, and I, I was with the people who had a bunch of books, and the leader of the, of the, uh, of the event, the organizer of the event, it's, uh, it's like, we, we didn't have a table, and she was the organizer, and she was like, you got books, oh my god, like, I'm getting tables, like, now, and she like, Told them, you, you go, you go, go. and the, yeah, they, they got tables up because there was nothing more important than they wanted than to have books available, you know, opposite of the United States of America. In the back? Yeah, Dan, is, uh, is the economy rooted in the sugar industry? Um, if so, isn't that a labor intensive? Uh, type of agricultural activity more so than any other? Before the revolution, for many decades, Cuba uh, was the main producer of sugar for the world, and for, certainly for the United States. And one of the first acts that, um, I'm not sure if it was Eisenhower or Kennedy did, uh, when the revolution triumphed, was to sh shut off the Cuba just cut off the sugar from coming into the United States and taking away the uh, ability of Cuba to make money by selling its sugar. It, what, Cuba needs a diverse economy, as, as, as do most countries. You can't just rely on one crop, especially if, uh, if the crop you're selling it to is the United States, which has the power to cut that off. So uh, yeah, there's still cane. Uh, what is different about the, uh, the, cane, the sugar cane industry, one of the things Che Guevara played a big role in, it's, it, it was very labor intensive. You're out there with a machete, snakes on the ground, it's hot. You're wearing uh, things like the catcher and the baseball does to protect your, your knees and stuff. You're cutting away uh, for hour after hour, being drawn away in baskets uh, with, a, with a horse or an oxen to the sugar refinery. But they mechanized that. That was one of the things the revolution addressed was the terrible hardship with the cane cutters. They were, they were employed, the cane cutters were employed half the year and then unemployed the other half of the year. So they, with, with tractors, and I'm not sure, but with the cane cutting uh, equipment, they were able to mechanize the sugar cane industry so that they could do it by, by driving a tractor right now instead of out there swinging a machete, uh, which is uh, hard work and dangerous work. So you know, that was, Che Guevara played a, played a role in that. Okay. Um, I think it might be time now to start heading to rebuttals. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people are chomping at the bell. Let's get a quick hand of how many want to rebut. And Landy, let Andy will uh, get a count and we'll apportion the time. Um, it is now roughly uh, quarter to eight. Quarter to eight, so. Yeah, keep your hands up whoever wants to give a rebuttal. I know there's quite a few people who want to say something tonight. Take your hands up and let's get a count. Charlie's one. Nobody on this side other than Charlie. That's two. Tim's three. Four. About eight, nine. Seven. Well, I'll call it ten or eleven. All right. Well, About four minutes, Andy. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with the usual four minutes. All right. Let's thank our speakers. Okay. All right. Uh,
um, okay. the uh, the uh, Cuba is a very small country. They're smaller than Illinois. Oh. And uh, you know, I'm I'm sorry, but if you don't have oil in your country, we're really not interested that much in what happens. So, uh, it's great that you have sugar cane, I don't think you have much else to export, but you only have 10 million, I think Chicago's almost the size of Cuba, so it's really, uh, you know, some of these countries are pretty, uh, you know, minor players, and if you don't have oil, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time and money on you. As I pointed out, we're more interested in oil wars. Oh, by the way, um, when I, when I spoke about the seven drone wars we're in, the, the seven oil drone wars, and the 15 other oil wars, 15 total oil wars, guess what country is not <clears throat> invaded by the United States in oil wars from the Middle East? Can, can I get a guess? Where we, no, we have bases there, so and we have active combat troops, but we're not you know, bombing them and stuff like that. So take a guess which country in the middle, which oil country in the Middle East, we're not droning, we don't have combat boats, we don't have oil wars going in. You are somewhere, you are a child, and you go in there and do which? Bingo, Iran. That's why we want to start a war with them. We don't have any military bases, we don't have any drone strikes. We don't have any uh, combat boots in Iran. Why do you think they're getting heat from us? We love oil wars. Um, I was in Cuba before the revolution and after the revolution. Uh, when I first came there, I, I went by the uh, palace. I'm, I forget the uh, area there, right by the palace. And uh, there was a black fellow sitting there. We start talking. He says, you want to go swimming? I says, I don't have no trunk, the trunks or anything. He says, we could rent it. So he didn't have no money. I paid to get on the bus. And uh, he, we went along. And one of the stereotypes of the Cubans were, you got to watch out for them. They got, all got knives and they could stick the knife in you and rob you and so forth and so on. So you had to take out all your belongings and put them in a little basket and then they, uh, you paid a certain amount for them to keep it until you have to uh, come out again. So we were both able to go swimming. So it wasn't that uh, black people couldn't go swimming. In the, they couldn't go swimming in certain places. If there was a yacht club or something like that, for the rich, they couldn't get in there. But they could go to public beaches. Um, but, but what you know, the first thing, you have a lot of beggars all over the place. It was full of prostitution. And you had a lot of Americans come down there. And that was one of the biggest uh, revenue sources was tourism. So uh, after... Uh, they, uh, after Castro came to power, I also went there, and they took us on a, on a trip to a collective type farm, and they gave us a good meal and everything, didn't cost anything. And of course, uh, uh, some of the people mentioned that Castro wasn't a communist. I don't care one way or the other if he was a communist or not, because I believe in that. So I didn't pay no attention to it. But the thing is, they got a lot of the people off the street. Uh, they uh, done away with prostitution. They have free medical care. They have free schools. Uh, you can go all the way to the university free and things of that nature. So they're trying to develop the economy. But if you go to the rest of Latin America, I was in Venezuela, and in Venezuela, if you look on the side of the hills, there's all these what they call favelas in Brazil, shanty towns, and mostly black people live there, and a tremendous amount of uh, prejudice. 
over there. And then there was the woman there that took us on this tour, and she had a big cross on her, uh, not a cross, a uh, Jewish star on her, and she was pretty well off, and she stopped talking against the poor people there right away. And I learned her father was in the government. So it's mostly controlled by the corporations and the rich for the most part. If you go to any part of Latin America, it's all the same. The people are extremely poor. They don't have no, nothing hardly at all. And they go around begging and they have prostitution for the most part. So, uh, and right now what's happening in Latin America, for instance in Brazil, and in Argentina and in Chile, the United States is trying to overthrow those governments and put the fascists back in, up into power down there. And uh, the situation is pretty bad in the, all of Latin America, except for people that have money. If you have money, you're okay. If you don't have money, you're nothing. They don't care about you or anything. And it's all the United States cares about is taking over the different uh, parts of the industry there, like in, for instance, in Brazil, they have Petrogas is the owner of the gas down there, and the United States is trying to take it over. And so they put the, the leader of the Social Democratic Party down, Olulu, in, he's in prison now and he's running for office. So. If you look at Latin America as a whole, it's mostly controlled by the imperialists, by the American imperialists, the French and the British, whoever could get in there. So they, need, they do do a need change, and what they're scared of about Cuba is not so much that Cuba is an exceed, can exceed or not secede, but they're uh, scared it might set an example for the rest of Latin America, and the rest of Latin America will get rid of imperialism. Can't let that happen. Good evening, I'm David Travis. Uh, in, uh, in the early days of the 20th century, or the, or toward the end of the of the 19th century, the U.S. kicked out old Spain from uh, our hemisphere under the auspices of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, and they um, took Cuba, they took Puerto Rico, and they took several other places. I think Guam was one of them. Anyway, uh, later, the United States gave Cuba back to the Cuban people. So Cuba has a lot to be grateful to the United States for, just on the basis that the U.S. gave them back their country, which they took from old Spain. Uh, I read in Forbes magazine that women in Cuba used to prostitute themselves for gold, for jewelry, and money, and luxuries, but that under Castro's Cuba, they prostituted themselves for medical supplies to get to their loved ones. Uh, Cuba has been no bed of roses. Under Batista, there were some people who were able to do good, uh, and I would mention one of them being Desi Arnaz. Uh, so it was really up to the individual if he had the gumption and wanted to better his life. It was possible. But under Fidel Castro, it was total an absolute misery. Uh, they had no chance of ever doing better unless they could get the hell out of Cuba. When Castro first took over Cuba during the, the first few years of his regime, 
they lost something like two-thirds of their doctors and their lawyers, their highly educated people. They lost them. And where did they go? To the United States. I met many Cuban doctors, and dentists, and so forth uh, during the, uh, the early 60s. <coughs> Around, up until around 65 or 66. Uh, they would have you to believe that this thing about Cuba wanting to educate all of their people, and they do. They do want to educate all their people. But it's the same thing as it was in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union wanted all of their people to be very well educated. But, they forbid them to read many books. And I'm sure if the Soviet Union did, so did Cuba. Uh, when the Soviet Union forbid them to read certain books, as Anne Rand pointed out in one of her books, Russia's best people was their own nemesis. And the same thing held true for Cuba. What's more, Cuba today is changing their constitution. They're allowing for free enterprise. They're allowing for private ownership. And in effect, they're moving toward a capitalist system. Be why? Simply because communism didn't really work. It never worked for them. They tried to make it work and it didn't work. The same thing as in China. China at one point in the 1960s, if you were a tourist and you went to Russia and you left it, you ate and left a tip, they'd take the tip. If you went to China and you ate and you left the tip, they'd run after you and say, this is yours. Like, like it was so much dirt and you were some kind of a corrupt bastard capitalist because they believed so strongly in their communism. That was in the 60s. To, but communism didn't work out well for China either. And so they have gone the capitalist route. But China has a thing about not wanting to lose face. So they have to pretend that they're really still, cap still communists while adopting capitalist principles and calling them communist principles. It's, it's all a lot of uh, hocus pocus, but really, capitalism is the worst system on earth except for all the others. Capitalism works. There is no utopia, but capitalism works. Thank you. Yeah, it worked for him. Yeah, work for him. Yeah, see, it worked. How many minutes will we get? Uh, four. Oh, four. Oh. It works. <laughs> Make sure I don't overdo it here. Take your time. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank the, the, I guess we had three speakers. I couldn't figure it out, but I guess there were three speakers. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank them for their talk. It was, I thought it was excellent. Uh, I do want to comment on uh, the interpretation of the World War II. I don't say the speaker was wrong, but frankly, I am glad that Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan did not win World War II. And I have to say, at least, maybe the United States is not perfect, but in World War II, there was a vote of the Congress. Maybe they weren't elected perfectly and all that, but uh, as I recall, there was a clear uh, vote, and we said we will go to war. Uh, I think that was a good thing. That at least we voted. Now, with regard to Afghanistan and 
Iran, Iraq, excuse me, and of course you could add to it uh, Korea, and you could add to it uh, Vietnam, and uh, a couple other wars. Uh, you're right, the speaker was correct. We did not get to vote even indirectly. It appears to me, and I hope somebody corrects if I'm not right, that the Congress of the United States gave to our administration the power to go in and go into police actions and so on. And then they did vote for money for the military and so on. But it was, in my opinion, a very democratic system. No, I didn't get much chance to vote on Iran, Iraq, and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, forget about Korea and, and uh, uh, Vietnam also. So uh, these are things I think we ought to, if we're going to go to war, if we are going to go to war, we, the United, at least the United States Congress, ought to declare that. I will say in closing that my church took a vote uh, on Iraq. They didn't take one on Afghanistan. They did take one on Iraq. Second Unitarian Church of Chicago. And we voted without a descending vote no on Iraq. So we were at least this church was totally against that. Thank you. Call me crazy. Yeah. Call me a little bit of a lunatic. Yeah. In the United States, it was the best of times and the worst of times. But the bottom line is, we're still the world leader in industrial production. We still have about 25% of the economy. And why do we have it? It's because we lean towards capitalism. <laughs> The problem with a lot of these third world countries is there's not enough capitalism. Oh, yeah. The poor cannot hold title, they cannot own a business, they cannot do a lot of the stuff that we in America take for granted because they don't have the tools that the government can provide. I'm going to take to you two examples. Cuba, over 50 years, is still a relatively poor country. Another one that was in about the same shape at about the time of Cuba was Singapore. Singapore chose the route of capitalism. They first stopped, they started with a little bit of land reform and giving the poor title to their own land. Second, they were able to mortgage that land and they had, for the first time, they could then license their businesses. Once you give a poor person title to their land or their home, able to register a business and establish a form of identity and then have the regulations in in court to settle disputes you're well on your way to getting a country developed the problem is in latin america and a lot of these other countries is that the barriers to business ownership the barriers to land ownership the barriers to title land is crazy in egypt for example to buy a house outright, it would take you, according to um, the book, The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto, almost 18 years, working eight hours a day, going through 365 government agencies to own your own home. So what do they do? They squat. They don't have the things. In this book that Hernando de Soto wrote, which was probably the second best selling book next to the Bible for a while in Latin America, outlines a process. He's from Peru. He was able to defeat, without firing a shot, the Shining Path, who were communist insurgents. The glories that they were promising, oh, that we're going to take over the rich war, basically fell on deaf ears once they heard about the reforms that the Institute in Liberty and Democracy had been provided. No. Capitalism, when it's applied properly, works. And even if it doesn't, 
it's still responsible for bringing most of the world out of abject poverty. We're 120 times better off than we were in 1800 with this. We're, we're seeing within, if I remember my statistics correctly, more people are getting out of abject poverty today and are capitalist countries than they are in some of these dictatorships. Yeah, good sweatshop job. Uh, Charlie, a sweatshop job, when it's applied properly by a major corporation, well, usually is a step you. up. Usually oh. is a step up from peasant farming. Uh, and most of those people who are peasant farmers want to be working at a place like that. And then after that, after that, what usually happens is unions form, then there's a, a, an awareness, a social inequity, and then there's reform. The one thing that I have to understand is that today we have a lot of powerful corporations in the United States and worldwide. And it is my opinion that it wasn't those guys that really shut down capitalism. No. It was because we were having the liars loans mortgage, we threw out our proper controls, and that's why we had a recession. Anyway, my time is up, yeah. and it's not just that it's not, not, we don't have capitalism in the United States, we have mercantilism. Oh, Adam Smith was go. against that, and he too was concerned about the poor. Well, my, my friends, I think Adam Smith was right. We need more capitalism, not less, but more business ownership, more reform. In, in the systems in these third world countries. It's better to get rid of a tin pot dictator, get in with some stable government, with some court reforms, give them title to their land, give them title to the business, give them the ability to do banking without a lot of extra bureaucratic nitwittery, and I think you're going to see the world prosper even more than it is now yeah. under globalization. Question. The name of the book? It's called The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. Now, the book was written in the early 2000s. He's still active in the Institute of Liberty and Democracy. And he's developing a new book coming out, I think, in another half a year or so, talking about how to fight terrorism by the implementation of capitalism and by the reforms that the Institute of Liberty and Democracy had. I could go on and on, but my time is up. Thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, in my view, the problem is not capitalism and communism. The problem is power. Power corrupts. Mm -hmm. So you see examples of communist uh, governments that have failed because people in power end up looking more towards their self-interest than trying to find follow the ideals of their economic principles. And the same with pure capitalism. Capitalism is, pure capitalism is a failure because rich people gradually take over more and more economic power and then because of economies of scale they end up controlling a huge percentage of the economy and you, you look at a uh, uh, the robber barons of 100 years, 150 years ago, and you're looking at the robber barons that exist now, and pure capitalism is just a nightmare. It's just a, a different title for the king, kings and the princes, and the people who run the country. And in communism, it's the same way, and I think uh, uh, Russia is like a great example how that just fell flat on its face. Uh, there, to me, it's not a black and white issue. Uh, I, I guess I look at the thing that I've read that really piques my interest is when people start interviewing populations of countries and, and asking them how happy they are. And uh, a lot of these uh, surveys are coming back where you're seeing people with social democracy, um, and especially the, the Baltic countries um, uh, like Sweden and Norway and uh, Denmark, uh, the people are incredibly happy. There's a very high tax rate, so industrialists really hate these countries. The capitalists do, do not like, the pure capitalists don't like these countries. It's hard to make money when you're getting taxed at a high rate. But the people are very happy, they're safe, they have 
access to good health care. They, there's a, a, a social safety network built into the government and the interests of the people is stressed very highly. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how Cuba ranks on that uh, uh, list. I'd be curious to find out. I was really interested to hear a perspective of people who are passionate for Cuba and have experienced Cuba. Um, I, I think that's buffered by the comment that um, that World War II was a horrible thing um, for the United States, as an example, the United States, which mystifies me. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the attack of the Philippines, the sinking of hundreds of ships by Nazi submarines in uh, the early months of 1942. We were attacked uh, it, it, without World War II. Without our involvement in World War II, most of Europe would be Nazi and a big chunk of Southwest Asia would be run by Japan right now. It really twists my mind upside down how somebody could look at the United States and use that as an example of how the United States sucks. I think it's really one of our shiny moments. So, some feedback. I, I, um, you kind of lost me with the Cuba uh, appeal, but i um, still open mind to it, and I do hope that they eventually the embargoes uh, drop so that they have some, uh, they, get, they get to decide uh, self-determination from an economic standpoint. Thank you. Who's going to move the Hi, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, I'm surprised everybody's cleared out tonight. It's kind of funny. Um, unusual, but thank you. I thought it was outstanding uh, talk because I've never heard any, uh, really, any talk like that that made me understand the revolution is a is a real idea. Really, all we are taught here in America, or all we ever hear is, I think I picture revolution like a violent, you know, thing. And um, clearly, America is, um, we're, we've got a lot of propaganda, really. We're, we're, like our thinking is so capitalistic that it feels scary to, you know, uh, think, socialism, communism, anarchism. Uh, there was so much PR, really, starting in World War I. Uh, that's how the PR industry was started, to promote war. People didn't want to go to war. People are naturally peaceful, and um, at least the women are, you know. Uh, and um, so they had to create enemies, and they had to, uh, you know, I think they I've read things about sending linen and, uh, you know, this whole Bolshevik thing was kind of construed. It's like a false flag terror attack to look how bad they are, you know. Um, and the Stalin, uh, you know, all the killing. It, it's really, I, once I understood false flag, it explains a lot to me that uh, America, capitalist, you know, the imperialists do use this technique. They created, they got us into Vietnam by faking the, the Gulf of Tonkin. They got us into uh, World War II by letting Pearl Harbor happen. They, you know, they create these things and a ton of propaganda. Uh, it's the first time I've ever heard that we're not allowed to give out books here, but uh, I, I'm more and more aware of the way the media is owned uh, by the capitalists to uh, really always show a right-wing point of view. And they spend all the time saying it's a left-wing point of view. I, I looked up DeSoto, uh, uh, and uh, see, my stepfather was uh, an Ayn Rand guy, a Milton Friedman guy, a chairman of the Manhattan Institute. And I, I was right, DeSoto, they, what they do is create right-wing propaganda, imperialist propaganda. And that Soto is one of them, the competitive enterprise. Institute, uh, you know, so, you know, I was, I was brainwashed, you know, and um, I'm really grateful to this opportunity to be unbrainwashed. It, you really have to reach for it and um, be involved in it. I'd love to go down to uh, Cuba. I think it's great. You know, really, uh, when I heard it was Cuba, I thought, well, 
I don't know. I don't know anything about Cuba. What do I care? But, um, you know, then I thought, well, yeah, it's relevant. But, uh, boy, I was really learned a lot because I go to these socialist clubs, the International Socialist Organization, which I think may be Trotskyist. Uh, you know, it's, there's like three different socialist groups here. Um, but one thing I think it's important to say is that I read today that um, really the idea of socialism was not, or communism, what it, it is not that you don't get to have your own house and your own things. I, I think that's a myth that we were kind of fed with Dr. Shivago, you know, they come and they move in on his house. And I, it doesn't have to be that way, right? It, you know, it's, um, it means they own, you know, they plan the economy. And really, we, right now, are, it's, it's kind of hidden, but our government, which is fascism, when corporate and government work together, uh, you know, that we, they basically, the CIA created Google, Facebook, the, all the advertising, everything. They plan our economy, and it's like, let's do 40% into bombs and planes and killing and taking and oil and bringing in opium from Vietnam. That's why we wage war, you know, and it, it's a great example of a shack that, that, uh, stands up and um, you know I, I'm a writer I want to give it more PR you know I signed up and um, I'm going to write about it because I think it's a story that needs to be told more movies more documentaries more more uh, coalition groups and uh, it, there's a big opportunity there I, I mean all you hear in the news I know I've heard that you know we used to have an embassy then of course Trump closed down every little you know EPA you know, uh, the Democrats, we thought, were at least opening doors. It's frustrating that both parties are pretty bad, but um, it's a spectrum, and we really are not hearing the left-wing peace point of view. <laughs> and the last thing I, I want to say, and I do think it's intriguing, the women. You mentioned, you know, the groups like the women, coalitions, and democracy. And... Um, Steve was telling me about the little girls, the way they got literacy, they sent 15 year old, 14 and 50 year old girls to live with people. That was Jane Addams' idea. She was a Christian socialist until they just beat her up and, you know, pushed her away. But the idea was that people who are educated just move in with the uneducated. And that's really how teaching is. I got a master's in teaching and philosophy of teaching. And, you know, that's really, they're putting into practice socialism, which is what we are, you know, and, and our best, at least the women are, you know, um, right? But yet yeah, we're too embarrassed to say it. So I think it's a feminist. I think it's, I'm emerging and look, trying to imagine being a feminist. I think um, it's interesting that the women's organizations are really a part of what's working, it sounds like, in Cuba. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Four minutes. Yes, yeah, I want to summarize us. We have this constant conflict between uh, capitalism, free enterprise, socialism, capitalism, because there's a struggle around the whole world. I think we need to find the right balance for all this. There's something good about both sides. One side doesn't look good at all. Um, socialism, for example, libraries, public education, that's socialism. Is that bad or what? Um, this healthcare issue is a serious problem. We've got to find some way for everybody to get into it. I mean, is it really for free or do we have to pay for it somehow? You know, it's got to be paid for. Somewhere along the line, we've got to pay for all this stuff. Now, on the other hand, the capitalism, like he said before, capitalism does work. It works for some, but everybody can benefit from it, too. I mean, think the work that uh, uh, Steve Jobs did, or Bill Gates, or anybody, the work they did, we all benefit. Yeah, they made a lot of money from it. We jealous because some people make so much money. It's, it's obscene. It's ridiculous what they do. I mean, especially like, it comes to like land ownership. It's kind of really off balance of that. Some people own all the land, the river, all the way to the ocean, or they own all this and that. Everybody pays them rent. That, that's good. That's a little bit out of, out of hand. It needs to be a real dialogue on land ownership. And we have to have land ownership for free enterprise. 
for that individual he's got the ideas he, he goes on he, he creates his own job he's got an idea he creates a job for other people but you're giving that freedom you got that freedom to go out and do that but he's got to have some limitations too just don't let anybody just do whatever they want to do but on the hand you, talk, you mentioned about things like Castro did you know with literacy uh, health care he made a complete 180 degree turn there and all this stuff is very important it's, it's, it's great what he did but um, economically how did they succeed I mean they need they, they need private enterprise just something got to be a mix of both we got we got to find the right proper balance for this not, one side doesn't fit both and uh, I think both sides make a mistake of this capitalism wants to dominate all this you know take over all the land all resources whatever that's wrong too it's got to be a mix, the right kind of a mix, the flavor yep. of where we stay on yep. this. Whatever it is, uh, how to get there, I don't ask how to get there. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Charlie? Yeah. Go ahead. Andy? That's what Charlie? Yeah. It was bullshit, Jay. It's really shit now. <laughs> Hey Tim, can you yeah. run? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like running. to thank our speakers tonight for an excellent presentation. And I would recommend to everyone once again. All right, gentlemen, let's. Nationwide groups are trying to get into schools for freshmen in high school. This Smedley Butler's book, General Butler from 1935, wrote a book called War is a Racket. And the United States has been involved in promoting wars here and there. For the profits of the companies that manufacture all the stuff. I was a, in Vietnam one night, I was a radio repairman, and uh, so we had uh, bunkers with uh, radios in them where we could listen to the gunships while they were up at night uh, when our bases were being attacked. So back there, quiet, I'm quiet. Up. having trouble. Did you guys take it outside first? We're trying to finish up here. No, not in the restaurant. Not in the restaurant. Just, just back, back, move out, move out outside. Thank no, you. not into the restaurant, please. Bad idea. It was 1967. Our base, base was being attacked at night. Um, we got into the bunkers before the first rockets hit. Rockets and mortars were shelled into the base every few days to wake us up. This was a place called Benoit, a big Air Force base where they had all the helicopters we repaired. I was uh, uh, aviation electronics. And um, we were listening on the radios to our, our, the, the pilots uh, in the gunships, and one of them said, uh, hey, we can see where the rockets are being fired out there in the jungle. You know, they called, called the general and said, uh, permission to fire on the enemy, sir. Permission to fire. He said, permission denied. He said it again. Permission to fire on the enemy. We can see where the rockets are coming in from the jungle. Permission denied. So the next day, after the attack was over, we all went back to sleep because it doesn't happen after that. They just wake us up and then uh, go on to the next day. I asked a uh, friend of mine who was a cruise ship, a uh, gunship crew chief, and he said, "I said, what's the deal? How come you couldn't get permission to fire on the enemy?" He said, "Well, if we could fire on the enemy wherever we see them, this would be over in a couple weeks." He said, "This is a controlled operation. They want to make money." Uh, spreading this out for several years. That's when I learned that we weren't fighting for freedom and justice. It had nothing to do with fighting an enemy for freedom and justice. It had, it was, I, I call it an after Christmas sale, like Walmart or Kmart, they have an after Christmas sale to clear the shelves to get new merchandise in. Well, when the military is full of bullets, bombs, missiles, shoes, whatever they're using, all the military hardware in peacetime, the shelves get full and they can't keep getting orders. The orders from the companies that sell to the military, their revenue starts to go down. So they schedule an after Christmas sale on some small unfortunate country that can't fight back, and they dump billions of dollars worth of hardware, the bombs and missiles, you know, uh, mortars, shell, whatever it is, and troops on the ground. You know, a lot of people don't realize it costs $2.1 million of our tax dollars to finance a year of one troop in Afghanistan. For the cost of one troop in Afghanistan for a year, one, one author said 2.1 million per person is what we're spending. You could give that 
bring that troop home and give him or her a four-year Harvard education and give away 43 Prius hybrids to people that uh, just can't afford a new car. And you'd save way more oil if, if it's all about oil, which it is, fighting for oil. You'd save more oil just stopping the killing and give away hybrid cars. But that's the military contractors don't want that. They don't make cars. They make missiles, planes, all kinds of stuff. Butler's book, War as a Racket, spells this out in detail. And it's a, it's a little book, about 60 pages, and it's a classic. We're trying to get it into high school so every freshman reads it before they ever see a recruiter. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Andy, your Facebook. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right, once again, let's thank our speakers. The guy, Steve, is out here. And I'll be eclectic as usual. Thank you for bringing in the literature as well. Uh, number one, Andy, Andy, the destruction wrought upon North Vietnam, that was all out war. And don't tell me that was constrained warfare. I didn't say They what? bombed that nation back to the Stone Age. There were so many craters. There wasn't a square yard of that nation. And to say that they were conservative in conflict is an absurdity. What are you saying here? They, the, have you ever seen what they did with the napalm? They were defoliating a country. And to say, oh, they were just kind of like enjoying themselves. No. No, I'm sorry. A good story, but it doesn't work. I uh, dropped that one. Uh, this is one about colonialism. They got to be thankful that Oh, they were occupied as a colony. They were made a colony in the, in the other country and made them, oh, they should be thankful. That's ridiculous. Uh, the other thing is there's as many forms of communism or socialism as there are countries that embrace it. American communism or socialism is going to be different than any other country. And this notion here, this guy that's sort of saying, well, all, all, all socialism is Bolsheviks, like the Bolsheviks had in the Soviet Union is not the case. As a matter of fact, there's no other country that's come close to having socialism, communism, that quite embraced what the Bolsheviks had in the in Russia. So that's that's a we've got to have better questions here at the college. Andy, we gotta do something here. Because they're stupid. They're getting really <laughs> stupid. What are you talking about? The questions. What kind of questions? Why is it why is the communism like Bolsheviks in Russia? Because it's a different country. Very simply. There's, what do you think? There's one form of democracy? Ridiculous. All right. I'm going to go on to another thing. Um, I was here many, many years ago. There was a visiting doctor from, uh, from Cuba. And we had a little banquet. Potluck they do it. Cammy see this here in Chicago. It's really kind of nice. We had a nice, nice thing, potluck and all that. And uh, the the doctor said, you know, in Cuba we only have maybe one good meal a day, and we don't have as much food as we have here in the United States. But what food we do have, we share. Uh, I ran into another thing, a railroad, or there was a guy in, that maintained, actually kept the steam engines operating on the island of Cuba. And he actually uh, claimed, for what I read, to have perfected, did make perfect uh, improvements in the operation of steam engines, which were forgotten about in the United States and the rest of the world for the most part. But he actually improved upon the steam engines, and he said they never should have gotten rid of them because they were very good devices. And uh, Con Tom, uh, Bill went. We no one. See us too much anymore. Uh, was an advocate of the bringing back the steam engine. Um, let's see. Uh, got something here about work. Oh, you know, there's another thing I wanted to mention, and I've studied a little bit of the history of agriculture and so forth. And from what I understand, probably the worst agricultural activity or manual labor you can engage in is the harvesting of sugar cane, from what I've read. Uh, and these people were literally enslaved in here to say, to say that that's what your capitalism did to them and colonialism. Oh, it was not properly applied. 
Yes, it was properly applied. It's called exploitation, pal. <laughs> it was very well applied in that island there. And, and they, so also they, did... They worked them for every dime they could get. The sugar, sugar daddies here in the States. And don't give me anything that was properly applied. Uh, and this other thing that... Desi Arnaz is an indication of the success of capitalism. But that's great. I love the college. Thank well, you very much. That is just so stupid. That's beyond belief. That is beyond belief. Who's seen Desi Arnaz? Two Baba, Baba, Reba. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie had a question there, and I'd like to answer it in 20 seconds or less. Yeah. Charlie said, why can't we get some better questions here? Is that what you're... Well, well you said that right. better than that. Well, Charlie, Charlie hit the nail right on the head. I've been giving speeches for, for 10 years on the media-generated bubble in America that maintains the bulk of Americans in a, in a bubble of incredible ignorance <laughs> on what's going on out in the real world. That's how you get questions like this. People, people are totally in the dark. They have no idea what's going on in Cuba. People don't know what's going on in, Cuba, in Afghanistan and Iraq. It has nothing to do with fighting for freedom and justice. Charlie is correct. They bombed, uh, they dumped tons and tons and tons of bombs on North Vietnam because that's what our generals want to do. They didn't achieve anything. And in answer to Charlie's question again, I was there in Vietnam personally. I was an eyewitness. Charlie was not. So uh, it's better to talk about something that you know something about oh, yeah. as an eyewitness. You don't have to go there to know about what took place. Um, well, it helps if you were an eyewitness. Okay. Okay. I don't know what happened to Speaker last word. Speaker here. gets the last word. So come on up and uh, in my walk. give us uh, the uh, rebuttal if you have one. I, I have a quick. Thoughts? Our Just a quick question for our speakers. On the oil wars. Uh, well, have you no. ever heard of a program out of Radio Havana, Cuba, called The Exers Unlimited? Yeah, I heard that. Before. You have? What is that? Yeah. It's a shortwave broadcast of uh, ham radio out of Radio Havana, Cuba, and they and they they talk about the ham radio hobby, and supposedly I don't. It's been a few years, but it was one of the most uh, highly rated programs with their host and it came out of Havana. Okay. You know, I just was curious if you heard about it or not. Yeah, I used to Have you heard about that? I had not that particular program. But okay. It's also it's a communication for sure. Right. And uh, anyway, but well, go ahead. Okay, I'm 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 not gonna speak I'm not gonna speak for ten minutes. I'm gonna raise something that hasn't that was not raised in the discussion. Okay. There's two Americas. America, the billionaire capitalists who own the factories, mines, and mills, and banks. They also own the Democratic and Republican parties. They also own the police. They own the courts. Then there's a, they're a tiny minority. Then there's those of us who produce all the wealth of this world. The working class, the small farmers. It's two Americas. Whenever anyone, especially the politicians, talk about us Americans, mm -hmm. watch out trying to put you in bed with, the, with your enemy, with your class enemy. Yeah. The U.S. government is a dictatorship of the rich. The workers produce all the wealth of this world to make the capitalists rich. They pay us enough to come back to work the next day. It's two Americas. That's why there's unions. Every capitalist country, everywhere there's workers, as unions, because we, because individually we have no power. Right. Only collectively do we have power. Wall Street. They have all the money. They have the government. We just got ourselves. I work at Walmart, biggest employer in the United States, for the crummiest wages and the worst benefits. But we're the future. We're the ones who have nothing to lose but our chains and fight against capitalist exploitation. So I'm just going to I'm just going to leave things at that. I could talk about North Korea and China and Russia and all that other stuff. I'd be glad to come back and talk about why there was a Second World War. Yeah. A question for you about what Walmart uh, senators uh, they, they authorized a bill. The, the suggestion is to tax the owners of Walmart 
for all the benefits, uh, like if a person is on food stamps and assistance and everything, all the money that the community gives to support that person because Walmart's not paying in the salary, they should tax the owners of Walmart 100% for that. Did you see that this last week? Well, no, but what I'm more interested in doing is organizing the rank and file Walmart workers to organize a union, whether that's a work stoppage or a walkout, a slowdown. The other traditional methods that the working class has used to win a union. We need a union there. By taxing the company doesn't get us a union. We still got arbitrary uh, firings, uh, low, low wages and working conditions and stuff like that. Well, we, need a, we need a union. Will they get in your way? Will they? Are they stopping you from organizing? Do you think? Of course. Of course. Oh, Walmart is hostile. Yeah. Of course. All capital. The United States used to have about one third of its workers in unions. Now it's maybe six or eight percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that sounds like Yeah, that's the challenge is to organize the unorganized, including undocumented workers, which we need to fight for amnesty on their behalf. But anyway, uh, <laughs> thank our speaker. If you haven't got a book, get one and educate yourself on the human rights. Okay, gavel us yeah, out if you yeah, don't mind. You. Gavel us out, said we're dismissed. You're welcome to come back. We're, uh, we're dismissed. Oh, the college is dismissed. Okay, tell, tell Charlie. All right, gavel us out, Andy. Yeah. Ah. yeah you okay, should, uh, this is it for the College of Complexes for September 1st. We're out, adjourned, and we'll see you all next week. All right, very good. All right. Thank you. Yeah.